Thank you, Warren, and good morning, everyone. Once again, I am left in this giant chamber with a handful of people. I would rather teach in a phone booth than have a packed house, but uh, so be it. And uh, it's a blessing to be with you, and particularly my friend Richard Vinson, who came and sat right behind me and told me he was here to harass me this morning. So thank you, Richard, for that. Uh, we are in Proverbs chapter 29. We're going to close out the 29th chapter, and we're going to move on to the words of Agur in Proverbs chapter 30. And we are making our way steadily through this book of Proverbs. I want, to sit, I want you to set a tab for me in John chapter 19, because we will look at uh, a passage there, I think, that will supplement our study, John chapter 19. So, here we are. Proverbs chapter 29, beginning in 25. 25 and 26 are actually linked. And I will, uh, with the same theme, so to speak, and I will try to demonstrate that to you. Uh, 29, 25, panic induced by a man lays a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord will be protected. 26, many are they that seek the face of a ruler, but justice for a person comes from the Lord. Now we're in 30, and this is very difficult. Uh, I'll explain here in a moment. The sayings of Agur, son of Jacob, uh, an oracle, the inspired utterance of the man to Ithiel. Now, this third line, I'm going to give you uh, the third line, and it will not be in your New American Standard, or it will not be in your King James. I am weary, I am weak, the word can be weak, weary, O oh God, but I can prevail. Now, this particular third line has been had much discussion on it and over it. Modern scholarship, uh, you almost hate to say modern scholarship because it's so liberal often, but modern scholarship has actually gone back to a translation of this line, this third line, to a Hebrew scholar back in 1699 and translated it something very close to this. Here's his translation. I have labored on account of God and have obtained. My translation, I am weak, Oh God, but I can prevail. Why do I submit that to you at Believer's Chapel? First of all, it's not for me to determine what the text is. Uh, I let the scholars do that, and I don't translate uh, freely. I accept that trend, the newer translation because I think it fits the argument that Agur is setting forth. And that's my job this morning to explain that to you so that you can see how the, this third line fits what he is saying. The alternative translation, which you have in King James and you have in the New American Standard, doesn't give us any information whatsoever. It just names more people. So, uh, with the idea that this fits the argument, I am going to submit that and I'm going to expound it based upon that uh, 
that interpretation, that translation this morning. Uh, here is 30 verse 2. Surely I am too stupid to be a man. Now, uh, I insert the word indeed because we are, we're going to be moving from third person to first person. He is talking about himself and he is summarizing to make a point. So, surely I am too stupid to be a man. Indeed, I do not have the understanding of a human being. Here's three. Indeed, I have not learned wisdom, nor have I attained to the knowledge of the Holy One. Well, that is our text for this morning. And we begin our exposition with Proverbs chapter uh, 29, beginning in verse 25, 25 and 26 being linked together. Panic induced by a man lays a snare. Those who trust in the Lord have nothing to fear from any person whatsoever. I think Charles Bridges does a better definition. Uh, the man who fears the Lord has nothing in life to fear. I think that's much better and much more comprehensive. Now, to understand the proverb, uh, let's go right to the heart of how to interpret it. Dan and I spent all day Friday in a seminar uh, on biblical interpretation, Old Testament interpretations into the New Testament. Uh, so I'm going to give you a good way to think about this proverb and this subject, and I'm going to do it in a different means of interpretation. Look at the word Lord. What is that? That's the covenant name. That is the voice of the burning bush. Okay, so what do we know about that name? Well, we know it cannot be defined. It cannot be explained. It comes from the verb to be. To be or not to be. I am what I am. And it's unexplainable. It's undraftable to the human mind. If we could define it and explain it, then we would understand it. And it's beyond our comprehension to understand. So that's the name that's used. We know He exhibited Himself in that voice of the burning bush. What did that voice of the burning bush do? It changed the life of an elderly man. It completely transported his life into a new direction altogether. We call that coming to Christ. Uh, regeneration. You're going one way and then suddenly you're going another. Uh, Paul was on his way to the Damascus Road when he was arrested by the resurrected Christ. And his life changed from that moment. That is this word, this name, Lord. And what else do we know about Him? Well, we know from that context that the prophet Moses, this elderly man who you would think is going to finish his life with these sheep out on the Midian desert working for his father-in-law, and he'll just die, and that's going to be the end of that. No. This voice had a great plan and a great purpose for his life. That's what we know. And he never saw it coming. Nor do you, nor do I. You don't know how he's going to use you in the future. You have no idea what his plan and his purpose for you is. But this man Moses followed that voice and did what that voice told him to do and he became the greatest leader in the entire history of the world 
he accomplished much. How so? Well, he stood before the Pharaoh, he delivered his word to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh was ultimately crushed. He humiliated all of Egypt. That's who that voice is. He then went on and spread a table in the wilderness for his people that they lived, they were comforted, they were fed, and he moved them into a piece of real estate that he had determined that had already for hundreds of years been inhabited by indigenous tribes. That's what this voice does. And the writer to uh, our, the psalmist makes reference to it in Psalm 44 and verse 3. It was not their sword that they possessed the land. Their arm did not bring them victory. It was your right hand. It was your arm. It was the light of your face that produced all of this. Now, now we're ready to move off that word, Lord. Now we understand how that word is used. And we are, look at your top line, where your second line there, we're to trust that name, that word. That's a very famous Old Testament word. It means reliable. You don't come up to a bridge and say, gosh, I don't know. I don't know if I, I want to drive my car across that bridge. You believe that bridge is reliable. You don't even think about it. You just motor on. That's this word. It's He is trustworthy. He is dependable. That is this word. And we are to trust in this voice, this one who resurrects careers, guides and directs, who knows the end from the beginning. That's who we're to trust in, in every matter. And He is going to work it all out according to His all-wise plan and purpose. And we cannot see that in any 24-hour day or week or month or even year of our life. But we just continue to trust Him. And He does. And He is faithful to work it all out for our benefit. Why? Because this voice keeps covenant loyalty. He is always going to love you unconditionally and do the very best thing for you. In the New Testament, He tells it this way to us. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's who this voice is. Now, let's go to the second most important word in the proverb. It is right there in line one. It is M-A-N. Okay, what do we know about him? Well, we know that he cannot endure. He is paltry. He's ephemeral. He is transitory. Matter of fact, the word is dirt. That's what the word is. From the dirt of the ground, he formed this man. That's who he is. He's common ordinary dirt. And he can't even take a breath except it be the will of God. That is uh, Daniel chapter 5 and verse 23. God in whose hands your very breath exists. I think the proverb now has been established. We have God, and we have man. Now we're ready to look at the proverb. Look. So the man here lays, it's actually the word to give. Here it is, Proverbs 1.4, for the giving of prudence. The man gives a snare. One man to another man. He lays a snare. We've seen that term before. It's used of a trap. 
different sizes, shapes. Thus the anxiety of the man. Because this dirt, this man, has got a plan and a purpose, and he's powerful, and he's bold. And in fact, with putting down that snare, it shows that the other man, the righteous man, the weak man, is going to be hunted. Psalm chapter 10, verse 8. Here's the description. He lies in wait uh, near the village from an ambush. He murders the innocent. His eyes watch in secret for his victims. Like, see, he's made one in the same of a lion, a comparison. He's like a lion in cover. He waits. He lies and waits to catch the helpless. To catch the helpless and to drag them off into his net. It's a, it's a picture of a lion who waits. It's a picture of a man who is ruthless, who uses a net and drags them away to death. Now, that's the activity. Where is the skill? Where is the wisdom here? What is it that we need to learn from this? Well, we understand, first of all, that this wicked man is temporal. Now, you look at him, he seems permanent, like he could last a thousand years. He is so powerful. He is bright. He is bold. He is of the earth, and people embrace Him and love Him, probably because they fear Him. But you and I are not to fear. We're not to be intimidated. Why? We are to be steadfast against Him. We are trusting in the Lord. Our reliability is in Him, not in things, but in Him. That's the proverb. And the wise person, according to the proverb, will always be kept safe. So, you be bold. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's really nice and pleasant and peaceful for you to be standing here in the midst of believers at Believer's Chapel, Dallas, Texas, and say, be bold. But when you go outside, there is the man waiting for you in all kinds of forms and shapes, and he has his snares, and he is frightening, and he is intimidating to us. So, how am I to be bold? Well, let's think about that just for a second. Uh, first of all, that's what Luther taught us. He taught us to sing it. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. They put Christians to the stake and burned them in the Reformation. The Roman Catholic Church burned Christian leaders all the time at the stake. One famous one was Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. And what happened that day? Well, they staked them, they started the fire, and Hugh Latimer yelled out, Be of good cheer, Mr. Ridley, play the man, that with the hope that we will light such a candle today in England, that will never be put out. Davigny, in writing on that, said he, they never yelled out. They never cried out. They were oblivious to the flames and the pain. You know what's interesting about that? All of the martyrs in the Reformation, according to Davigny, never cry out, never holler out, and I think we understand why, don't we? All you have to do is read Daniel. Their three men were thrown into the cauldron of Nebuchadnezzar, but there were four in there. Christ never leaves you. He never forsakes you. 
He is in the fire with you. Now, that's beyond human explanation. I can't explain that. I just know what the Bible says, and I believe it, and I trust it. So, let's think about that candle for a moment. I just was in free thought, and I wrote down that candle. Here's what I wrote. Uh, William Tyndale, George Whitfield, um, John and Charles Wesley, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Richard Baxter, uh, George Mueller, John Owen, David Martin Lloyd Jones, J.I. Packer, John Stott. That's the candle. It goes on and on and on. You can't extinguish it. What's the proverb saying? You're going to be kept safe. Don't you worry. I will be there at the time you need me. You be bold and you'll be safe. He goes on. Look at 26. Same type of message. Often for justice, the voice of a king made a matter permanent. The obvious can a contrast here in the proverb is the ruler who we always assume, assume is a righteous king in line one to the Lord in line two. Our proverb opens with the word many. That's Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 6. Many seek the face of a generous man. Same word. Seek the face. That is to be before in the presence of. To be before the Lord. That's the idea. The face of the Lord. And for the human element, to be before the face of the king. 1 Kings 10.24 The whole earth sought the face of Solomon to hear his wisdom. The phrase means to regard, to respect, to revere. I just want to listen to what he has to say. Now, line two supplies the predicate. Look at this. Asserting that justice, truth, equity, fairness, sincerity for the individual person comes from one source over the ruler who determines the mind and the heart of the ruler. That's where justice, equity, fairness really is transpired from the Lord God. Now, you know, in Exodus, how we have those commentaries and we have those studies and we have all these lines and they got all the verses and they show this is Pharaoh hardening his heart. And then here's another bracket, and this is the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart. Well, guess what? That's nice to know, but it's not relevant. Here's why. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 19. On the Midian desert, the Lord, the voice of the burning bush says to Moses, He will not let you go except compelled by a mighty hand. That's the whole drama of the Exodus. The imbriglio being played out there between Moses and the Pharaoh, if you will. That's what it is. It is God's mighty hand breaking, crushing, the Pharaoh and crushing Egypt. Now, here's what I don't want you to miss. You to miss. It's Exodus chapter 7 and verse 1. You don't need to turn there. I'm going to read it to you. God says to Moses, I will, or I have made you, it's participle, 
I have made you like a god to the Pharaoh. Now, what were the gods to the Pharaoh? The Pharaoh had many gods. He respected them. He appreciated them. He was contrite before them, humbled, if you will. And what the Lord is saying to Moses, I have taken you, the common man, the man who was standing just weeks before in the Midian desert with a stick in his hand in the midst of sheep, and I have now made you like a god to this Pharaoh. You're just, you, that's your appearance to him. What are you and I to do with our lives from this day forward? Fear Him. Honor Him. Walk in obedience to Him. Draw close to Him. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a purpose. And Moses didn't have the slightest idea what that plan and purpose was when he was standing out on the Midian desert. But God did. And what are you and I to do today? Walk with Him. Listen to Him. And in doing so, we will find His will for you and me without exception. So here is our mind. John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. Pilate the Roman, the Roman procurator of justice, righteousness, fairness over the territory. That's the pilot. He says to the Lord Jesus, don't you know that I have the authority, I have the power to release you? I have the authority, I have the power to crucify you? Don't you realize within myself, my person, that I have that kind of stroke to do that? And here's Jesus' answer. You would have no power, you would have no authority if it were not given to you from above. That is the mind I want. That's it. I'm undaunted by people, by circumstances, by power, by authority. Mine comes from heaven alone. And I depend upon Him to work His will in my life from this day forward. Let's think how you do that. So Paul comes to Corinth. Big revival going on in Corinth, is it? Hardly. It's a pagan town. Vast, like Dallas. Imagine, you're the only Christian and you come to Dallas. Think about that. Well, here's the way Paul described it. He said, I came in fear and trembling. He saw downtown Dallas, and it intimidated him. It would intimidate anyone. He saw the vast freeways and the cars going up and down the freeway, and it intimidated him. That's what Paul says. He, was, he came in weakness and fear and trembling. But what did the Corinthians see? What did they see? They didn't see fear. They saw boldness. They saw power. A demonstration of power by the Holy Spirit. And by the Word of God. And He built the church. And he, because He built into the lives of believers who fear the Lord, and have heard His Word. And He did a great work. That's what they saw. And that is really all that's important. 
in weakness. Not like he was going to Damascus. No, he was going to Damascus. He was riding the white horse, see? And he was going to round them all up. We're going to round them up. And we're going we're to do this, and we're going to do that. But what was he like in Corinth? He was weak. And yet, God was the power behind him and accomplished so very much the church at Corinth. Here's 30. And this are the collection of wisdom from the man Agur. And rightly so, the Word of God re recognizes his skillful father, his all wise father, the man that is going to make a great impression upon us had a very wise father. Proverbs 10.1 A wise son brings joy to his father. A foolish son grief to his mother. You know what's the most important word? Brings. You know what I think about brings? I think of standing on the shoreline and watching those waves come in and in and in. That's the wise child, the wise son, the wise daughter. They never stop. They keep coming and coming and coming all during your life, bringing blessing after blessing after blessing. That's why there is joy for the parents. Now, here's 30 verse 1. The sayings of Agur, this is we take as a superscription. We revere the superscriptions. We consider them holy. And this is an oracle, which is an inspired utterance to the man Ithiel. Now, this is the final division of the Proverbs. And what we have here is the beginning of the introduction, verses 1 through 9. Agur's confessions and prayers. Let's begin with the superscription. Which you know is Holy Scripture. Even though all it does is define or explain or give a name we revere it. It's in the text. So we treat it that way. Look at the word sayings. Revelation spoken in wisdom. The skill for living came orally, passed down generation to generation. Man typically depicted in the Proverbs, as we just noted, dirt, clay, he comes from the ground. He's here. He's gone. He's transitory. What we want to know is while he, before he returns back to dirt, how should we conduct our affairs in this life? Here's how we find out. Look at the word saying. It refers to how wisdom was passed down in ancient Israel. No one had Bibles. No one had parchments. No one but the priests and the scribes had pens to write on. It was passed down one to another. That is sayings. Notice it is confirmed to be Holy Scripture by line two. You see that? Inspired utterances. God by His Spirit is the giver of wisdom and it's passed down. Proverbs 2.10, wisdom will enter your heart. It goes right into the soul of man. If you prize it, if you ask for it. Agur, his name, means reverence. So let's reverence him. It comes from the root to, to fear, to dread his father Jacob. Uh, Man to be admired. We hold him in high esteem. His name means receive. He received the revelation that was given to him, and look what he did with it. He passed it down. He passed it down to his son, 
now. Here we have this oracle, meaning inspired utterance. That's 2 Samuel 23, 1. The oracle of David. This is Holy Scripture. These are words that we live by. I think that was uh, the radio ministry of Richard DeHaan. Uh, words to live by. That's what this is. Ithiel is the student, but in reality, we're all Ithiel. We're all the student here to learn and to listen to what he has to say. So it is passed down generation to generation from the Lord's mouth into this young man's ears, and we're going to learn. Now, the difficult line, line three, he says, I am weak, O God, but I can prevail. We have moved here, notice, from third person to direct discourse. That's important. We are now using the word I. So he involves us. We're ethereal. We're the ones that are receiving the wisdom itself. It involves you. It involves me. It is these words to us directly. Weary. Weak. He tries to find wisdom, but he can't find it. Notice we understand that, the, that this is a believer who wants to learn the skill for living, but he doesn't possess it. Now, here's how we are all ethials. We hear a sermon. And we walk up to Dan and we say to him, I needed that today. That was such an encouragement to me today. Uh, Dan, look at my notes. I've written all over them. Uh, they, they were so powerful and rich. And you gave me exactly what I needed. I was so convicted by what you said. What does that demonstrate? Not your strength. It demonstrates our weakness. We need that constantly, don't we? We need that Word to refresh us and to build us up all the time. That's not power. That's weakness. That's what he is saying here. He wants to be wise, but he can't. And he's weak. He doesn't have it. He seeks for wisdom, but it's not there. How is it not there? It's not in his mind. And so in the Jewish thinking, it would not be in his heart. His heart and his mind are one and the same. It doesn't exist there. So, in this word weak, he is open and honest by declaring his ignorance to be great, he calls out direct discourse. Oh God, that's a prayer. He calls out to the Eternal One. I am in great need. But here's what he tells us. Despite his need, he says, I can prevail. Meaning, I can accomplish. How can he accomplish? Seems a contradiction. You have nothing, and yet you say you can accomplish. So a guru is declaring a tension for us that has to be discovered. We have to figure it out. He has no wisdom in himself, and yet he's saying that wisdom can be procured. Now he goes on to explain. Here's verses 2 and 3. Surely, or 4, I am too stupid to be a man. Uh, he's not being self-deprecating. He is under the inspiration and authority of the Word of God. He is explaining to us the truth all about ourselves. That's what's going on. Indeed, I do not have the understanding of a human being. 
Indeed, I have not learned wisdom, but I want to experience the knowledge of the Holy One. Let's look at the text. Surely for a word of explanation. It's an explanation of his weakness. That's too stupid. He wants to know God, but he can't. It's not there. The effects of the fall. It's impossible for the rational mind to elevate itself to God. That's what he's saying. I'm blind to God. I am blind to the things of God. Otherwise, otherwise it would just take a high IQ, wouldn't it? But Albert Einstein wasn't a Christian. William F. Buckley called Bertrand Russell the most educated man he ever knew. At age 11, Bertrand Russell wrote and described geometry in a way that no one had ever written about it or described, or described it here before. Mathematics eventually he didn't consider to be that important, so he moved into the area of analytic philosophy, the study of logic. He wed the principles of mathematics to logic, he came up with laws, rules uh, that help for precise thinking. He was the master of much. He actually wrote a history of Western civilization. Imagine that. And any number of essays that were all about the different varieties and ways to analyze and think about life. And one other. May 1st, 1957, entitled, Why I'm Not a Christian. Bertrand Russell. He had a great mind. Well, what happened? Look what Agur says, there's no understanding. It is one thing not to know, but here's something far worse not to know that you don't know. That's far worse. Indeed, I've not learned wisdom. Have not learned. Born in darkness, he grew up to manhood, but his mind didn't improve. Not in the things that are spiritual and important. He was Johnny Cash's boy named Sue. He grew up quick. He grew up mean. His fists got hard, his wits got keen, but to the things of God, there were nothing. They didn't register on the scale for him. Look at wisdom. It's too high for him. The knowledge of the Holy One. He says literally, I don't know. I'm, I'm truly don't know, and the reason he doesn't know is because everything is independent from God. That's the way he sees it. Well, here's news for you. Study the Bible. Everything is interconnected to God. He is the creator of all things. He's the one that is the interpreter of all things. The late Carl Sagan, the atheist, your tax dollars and mine. The cosmos. PBS, remember? And he starts the program. All that ever was, all that ever is, all that ever will be, is the cosmos. No, Carl. I don't grant you that. That's not the beginning. No, here's the beginning, Carl. In the beginning was the Lord the God who created heaven and the earth. The cosmos was a creation. It's just a creation, Carl. It's not starting point. I won't grant you that. No. That's why you're an atheist. Your system is closed off. You don't see how anything interrelates to anything. You say, well, I'm at world's authority on the human heart. Good for you. 
Now tell me about the heart. Well, here's a, here's a valve, and here's a chamber, and here's this chamber, and that chamber, and here's another valve. But if you don't know how that heart that you know more about than anyone else is interrelated and connected to the body, you don't know anything. You've got to see it as a whole. And God connects all the parts. He puts it all together. So this man, his starting point is simply this. And here's where we'll close. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. He's a blank slate. He wants to know God, but he can't. He's very wise. The natural man, said the Apostle Paul, does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. Sin has cut his mind off. So he doesn't know. What's worse than not knowing? Not knowing that you don't know. That's where we are. That's why you need the Scriptures. That's why you need the Word of God over your mind at all times to give you perspective, to give you energy, to help you progress. Moses was a great leader. He was a great leader. He accomplished much because he did one thing. He followed the Word of God. Will you follow the Word of God? You see, I don't care how weak you feel. That's not important. It's what other people see. And they see the power of God. And that's where you want to be. That's where I want to be. That this Word would richly dwell within you. Now, now your life will be changed forever. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank You for the Scriptures that give light, illumination, perspective on all of reality. Lord, we know nothing but we know we belong to You and You will see us through because You have a great plan and purpose for each and every one of us and we wait to see it, to hear it, and to follow it every day as we listen to Your Word. In Jesus' name, Amen.